Well, I want to thank Peter for a good lesson this morning and uh, kind of giving me a break too as well. It's not often that on a Sunday morning I get to just sit down and listen to somebody else teach a lesson, so I'm very grateful for that, and he did a good job for us this yeah. morning. We have been studying on Sunday nights the book of Romans, and tonight we're in Romans chapter 7 where Paul begins to, to talk to the the Roman church about the law and the fact that you're no longer under the jurisdiction of the law if you are in Christ. And so what we see is the law principle and the gospel. Uh, if, if you are living under the law, if you are living under the law principle, not just the Old Testament law, but living under the law principle, you're trying to earn your salvation, you're trying to live your life under the law, then you're, you've got to live it perfectly to receive any, any kind of salvation. The minute you falter, the minute you fail, what does the law do? It condemns you. The law says you have sinned. And it does nothing to save you. But in Christ, what is imperfect, man who sins, can be made perfect by the blood of of Jesus. So it is a wonderful uh, example for us, a wonderful lesson for us to learn and to understand. And so in Romans chapter 7 and verse 1, it reads, and we're introduced to this law principle. Or do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. So here is the law principle that Paul puts forth. Those of you who know the law, who would be those who know the law pretty well? The Jews would certainly come to mind, right? Those who would know the law very well. He says, do you not understand that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? And that's true, isn't it? As long as I am a citizen, I am alive and well, and a citizen of the United States of America, I am under that law. I'm under the law of the state that I live in, and I'm also under the federal law. But as soon as I die, does, does the state or the federal government have any more jurisdiction over me? No. Now, some people might speak up and say, well, what about those inheritance taxes? And well, that's for my children to figure out, right? That's, all that kind of stuff happens for them. No longer am I being held under any accountability to the law of the United States of America or to North Carolina, the state in which I live, because I am dead. And so that's the principle that he puts forth. But as long as I'm alive, I'm under that jurisdiction. I have to live according to the rules and to the ordinances and the statutes that the law has given. And so there's this issue. I'm, I'm under the law. As a Jew, I'm under the law. So what needs to happen? What, what, what has happened in Christ? Look at verses 2 and 3. He gives us the illustration to help us understand a little bit better. For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning the husband. So then... If while her husband is, is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, though she is joined to another man. And so he uses this, this illustration, this marriage illustration, to help us understand the idea of being under the law or being set free from the law. And it happens when a death takes place. Place. When you look at this marriage relationship, some people come to this chapter and to these verses to start talking about marriage. And marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and, and they start to, to talk about different doctrines about those things. That is not at all what Paul is trying to do. He's not trying to teach us anything about marriage. What he's saying is, you who know the law should understand this. You should understand 
what happens within a marriage. As long as this husband and wife are married and bound to one another, as long as he lives, as long as she lives, they are bound to one another according to the law. But as soon as one of them dies, the other is set free. And they are allowed to marry someone else. Now he goes on to say that if one is still alive and the other is alive and one decides to marry another man or marry another person, then they would be called an adulteress. But what is he saying? They're still bound to that law as long as they are alive. So how are we brought under Christ? How are we brought into Christ? If, if we are under the law principle, if we are bound to the law, especially thinking about these Jews and those living uh, the Jewish lifestyle, or even those according to the law principle, trying to live and earn salvation according to the law principle, what can we do? How do we get out of that law principle situation? Notice verse 4. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another. To him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. Now this is interesting. Now here's, here's, the, here's the basic application. The first husband is the law. The second husband is Christ. Now if I'm alive to the law, I can't, I can't marry another, right? So what has to happen? Well, the law is not going to die. So if the law is not going to die, what needs to happen? Well, I need to die. But if I die, aren't I just dead? So what, what has Christ done for us? Look at verse 4 again. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ. Because of Christ giving his body on the cross, because of us in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Now you see the connection here? What's happened? We have now died to the law principle, trying to live a life governed by earning our salvation, by living perfectly under a law system. Whether we were a Jew or whether we we're a Greek, we don't have to live under that law principle, that law system of trying to earn our salvation. I want you to understand that. We're not talking about, well, now that I'm in Christ, I don't have to pay attention to the laws of the land anymore. That's not what we're talking about because in Romans chapter 13, what does Paul say? You need to obey the laws of the land, right? So he's not talking about the laws of the land and those kinds of things. He's talking about this law principle of earning salvation. If you are under the law, then you've got to live perfectly to earn that salvation. But we know we can't. What did Paul say earlier in the book? Everybody has sinned. Doesn't matter if you were a Jew or a Greek. Doesn't matter how, how great your parents were. Doesn't matter how, how great you've been at keeping the law. Or doing good things. Every single one of us has fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us has sinned. Therefore, we cannot be saved by the law because all the law does is say, you sinned. It can't do anything to save you. And that's what Jesus has done. He's, he's done the work so that we can be saved. But notice this. Because of His body... Because of our obedience to his gospel, to his death, we die to that law system or that law principle. And now we get to live under Christ or in Christ or in grace or in the spirit of life instead of living under this law situation. Now that doesn't mean that Christ does not expect or demand or command anything of us. Jesus has high expectations for us. 
You might even say the expectations are higher under Christ than they ever were under the law. There's still commandments to be obeyed in the New Testament. While we have been set free from the law principle, we're not bound by the Old Testament law anymore either. We still have laws to obey under Christ. Jesus said, if you want to be a disciple of mine, what do you got to do? You better pick up your cross daily and follow after me. What is he saying? You're not living for yourself anymore. You're living for me. This new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. What is he saying? You need to be willing to give up your life to save a brother or sister in Christ. You better be willing to lay down your life for the church just as I laid down my life. I loved you as a friend and I gave up my life. Jesus expects quite a bit of us. It doesn't mean that there's no expectations for us anymore. But it does mean that we no longer have to live according to the law principle of earning our salvation in, in the sense that the Jews had to do it. Or how many other denominations, how many denominations or other uh, religious organizations try to tell you, well, you need to do more good than bad or you need to do this perfectly. We don't have to live by that kind of standard. But we are living according to Christ's standard, which means we better take it very seriously. Now, if you continue on here, we, we see this application. The first husband was the law because of Christ and his body. We have died to that law. And now we are living with married to Christ. He is that second husband, the one that we are married to now. And we are living under him, And as you continue on in verse 4, it says, So that you might be joined to another, that is Christ, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. So Jesus certainly expects us to do something, doesn't he? In order that we can do what? Bear fruit for God. He expects quite a bit. And that doesn't just mean, well, I... I better have the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. It means I need to be sharing the gospel because he wants more Christians. He wants more people added on to his vine. He wants more branches attached. He wants more fruit being born. He wants more people in his church. It means doing good deeds. And helping those who are in trouble. Those who might be poor. Those who are widowed, visiting the orphans and widows, as James would say in James chapter 1 and verse 27. But if you continue on into verse 5, it's not just this idea of doing good things, but there's still a struggle. There's still an issue that's taking place. Verse 5 says, For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. What is he saying? Through the law, sin was taking opportunity. Through the law, Satan was taking opportunity. And he was making it so that sin was abounding all the more. And what were we doing? We were bearing fruit for death. Go back up to Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. What does it say? The wages of sin is death. If I continue to sin, if I continue to live that way, well, the law is going to continue to say, there's another one, another sin. Just put another line there. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. Another sin, another sin, another sin. And what does it give me? What fruit does it bear? Death. If you continue on in verse 5, uh, sorry, into verse 6. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, 
so that we ma- so that we serve in newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And so we begin to live according to the spirit instead of living according to the flesh. And that's a struggle that Paul is going to continue to talk about in Romans chapter 7. He talks about his own personal struggle of the fle- of living according to the flesh but Striving to do what is right, what is good, trying to live by the Spirit, but at the same time he's struggling to deal with overcoming these sinful desires that are within him. So when you look at these first six verses, one might be willing to say, well, why did God give the law? Why why did God even do that in the first place? Is the law evil? Is the law sinful? That's the exact question that Paul puts forth in verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin taking opportunity through the commandment Produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. Now, what is Paul saying here? Did the law come after Paul was born? The law, at least the law of Moses, was given 1,400 years before Paul was ever born. What was he saying there in verse 9? I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. The commandment had always, had already, has always been there in Paul's life. At some point in Paul's life, you know, people call this the age of accountability. At some point he understood what coveting meant because he understood what the law meant. Whatever age that was, or whatever, whatever moment he began to discern between right and wrong because of what the law had taught him, was when sin was brought forth in his life because he started coveting. He started understanding that he was lying. He started understanding that he was stealing. He started understanding that he was doing all of these things and that they were wrong according to the law of God. And so when that happened, he died. And the same is true for us. We understand right and wrong, and we know the law, and we do the wrong. We go against the law. We sin, and we die. Verse 10, And this commandment which was to result in life, talking about the law and commandment, this law was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. And the same is true for us. For sin taking an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. That's what sin does. That's what Satan did with the commandments. When they were given, what is, what is, oh, just go all the way back to the beginning with Adam and Eve. There's one pretty, sim- there's, there's a few couple commandments given, but there's one very simple one. Just don't eat of that tree. Because the day you do, you will surely die. So what does the serpent do? What does Satan do? Well, Eve, I mean, you know it looks good, right? It looks good to eat. Not only that, if you eat it, You'll become like God. You'll gain knowledge. The reason God doesn't want you to eat that is because you'll become like Him. In fact, the day you eat of it, you will surely not die. Satan and sin take opportunity through a single commandment right there at the beginning. Now think about 613 commandments in the Old Testament. How much opportunity is given there? for Satan and for sin. Quite a bit. And the law can't do anything for you 
in regard to that sin. That's why Jesus needed to come. If you continue on in verse 12, so then, the law. You see, Paul isn't trying to give the law a bad rap. He doesn't want them to think that the law is sinful because he says in verse 12, the law is holy. But why is the law holy? Because the giver of that law is who? God. God Almighty. And he is holy. The, the law itself is holy, is right, is true. It's righteous and it's good. Nothing wrong with the law itself. It just can't provide you with the salvation that you need because of your sin. Verse 13, therefore, did that which is good become a cause of death for me? May it never be. Rather, it was sin. In order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good so that through the commandment sin would become utterly sinful. He doesn't want the Romans to think that the law is bad. He doesn't want them to think that that which is good, that which was holy and righteous and good, verse 12, was a, became a cause of death for him. So what does he say? It was sin, verse 13. The law itself wasn't what brought about my death. Really, what is he saying? It was me. It was my sin. May it never be, rather it was sin. That's what happened. All the law did was point out what sin was. But you see, what's important is going back to verse 6. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter. We are not bound to the old law, to the law of Moses. We are not bound to the law principle of trying to earn our salvation by doing everything perfectly. Jesus already lived the perfect life. He died and he gave his body so that we could die to that life of sin and death, trying to live up to a perfect standard of law. We don't have to do that. What we do need to do is obey the gospel message. Here's a question tonight. Who do you want to marry? According to this passage, there's two husbands. There is the law husband, or there is the Christ husband. If you want to stay married to the law, that is your choice. But what Paul wants you to understand is if you stay married to the law, guess what? Sin is going to take opportunity after opportunity. And if you go to verse 13 in Romans chapter 7, not only did that sin affect my death by which that which is good, but so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful. It just gets worse and worse. Do you want to continue to be married to the law? Or do you want to be married to Christ? The one who sets you free from living under the law principle and being bound by the law. And beginning to live and serve in newness of the spirit. To live, to have life. If you go back to chapter 6, verses 22 and verse 23, talk about what Jesus gives. The free gift of God is eternal life. We, result, we receive sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. Or we could go ahead and skip on to chapter 8 and verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Who do you want to be married to? 
I think it's pretty clear that the best husband in this situation is Jesus. He's the one that we need to marry. And you can bind yourself to Jesus tonight by putting him on in baptism, by being buried in his death. Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Rising up in newness of the spirit as a new creation in Christ. Living a life not bound to the law. A life that is free. A life that you can be forgiven of sin. Not only set free from the law principle, but also set free from sin and death and receive the gift of life. The life that only Jesus can give. If you're ready to do that this evening, the invitation is for you while we stand and while we sing. There's a fountain free, tis for you.